Hydrogen is the most abundant of all chemical elements, and as a future source of fuel, it's the most talked about. So how long has hydrogen energy technology been around? And how can it help us to discover when we might see hydrogen powering the vehicles of tomorrow? In 1806, a Swiss inventor was one of the first to build an internal combustion engine, powered on a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. Gasoline was not used to power internal combustion engines until 1860. The application of creating a flammable air fuel mixture in a combustion chamber, development of the modern car engine actually got its humble beginnings from a hydrogen powered engine. A similar story can be found for fuel cells. The first fuel cells were developed by Welsh scientist Sir William Robert Grove in 1845. In 1958, fuel cells were on the way for use in the NASA Gemini space program. With transistors only starting development in 1947, the fuel cell technology has had a considerable head start of economically and cheaply producing a product the world is waiting for. So exactly how does a fuel cell work? What we're doing is using a power pack to, get, to do some electrolysis on the water. And electrolysis is the separating or the splitting of water to produce hydrogen and oxygen. When it does produce the hydrogen and the oxygen, it's stored in these cylinders and you can see in here, this is oxygen, this is hydrogen, and that side's oxygen. When you've got enough hydrogen in there, you can unplug it, connect the electric motor, and the hydrogen will come out through the pipe, it will go through the membrane, and because hydrogen is just a single electron, that electron generates a, an electric current which will drive the motor. When the hydrogen goes through the other side, it mixes or meets up with the oxygen again and produces water vapor, water. So we actually start with water, finish with water, but in between we generate an electric current. So if I join it all up, it is now running on water. And until that hydrogen is all used up, we just keep running. That's a fuel cell. That's a fuel cell. Hydrogen fuel cell. Is that metal? I don't know. It's a special metal. And it only allows a one-way transfer. And as it goes through, it just generates electric current. So, it's a novel little discussion point for year 10s, 11s, or 12s. Just to get them to think about re recycling fuel, carbon footprints, and greenhouse gases, and alternative energies. And are there vehicles like this on the road at the moment? Yeah, there are. There are buses in Perth that actually use hydrogen in cylinders as a roof. Right. So what they're doing, they're cutting out the water. They're just using the hydrogen to go across the membrane. When it comes out the other side, it meets up with the oxygen in the atmosphere. It goes out as water vapor. Right. Um, in Europe, you can go into a, fuel cell, into a service station, like we pump LPG, you can pump hydrogen. Wow. So they've actually got the cars that are generating that making that process of using hydrogen as an electric source. Sounds amazing. A fuel that burns only to leave water vapour. And the fuel is found in splitting the hydrogen out of water. What a great idea. You can even use wind and solar to produce the hydrogen. Cars like the one pictured here are on the roads driving around now, albeit very expensive. Not to mention it costs a lot to fill up a hydrogen powered car. Most of the hydrogen used today is produced from natural gas through a process called steam methane reformation. High pressure as well as temperature break down the hydrocarbon into hydrogen and carbon oxides including carbon dioxide. Perth's fuel cell bus is supplied with hydrogen in BP's Kiwana oil refinery which produces 50 to 100 tonnes of hydrogen per year. Only a small amount of hydrogen is supplied from actually splitting water from hydrogen with electrolysis. But with nearly all of Australia's electricity coming from coal, hydrogen is still very unattractive. With hydrogen, there's no infrastructure for hydrogen. We can't mine it out of the ground, we have to create it. Uh, there's no way to store the hydrogen. The, uh, the efficiency of creating hydrogen from electricity is still at a very low uh, the efficiency is way too too low to to make it practical. So um, the so the uh, hyd the hydrogen bullet, if you wish, is not so red at all. It's pretty tarnished. <laughs> Let's have a look at the numbers. 
Nuclear power can produce electricity to power electrolysis. Nuclear power plants can also produce hydrogen directly, either by adding steam and heat to the electrolysis process or by a series of chemical reactions that split the hydrogen from the water. If North America was going to change from using fossil-based fuels to hydrogen by 2040, it would require 2,600 megawatt next generation nuclear power plants to do so. Or 1 million 2 megawatt wind turbines, 113 million 40 gigawatt solar systems covering around 150 million acres of land, 77,000 extra natural gas reformation plants, or an extra 1,000 275 megawatt cold steam reformation power plants. To put it another way, if Frankfurt Airport has about 50 jumbo jets leaving a day, each charged with 130 tonnes of kerosene in a 160 cubic metre tank, hydrogen would only have to be 50 tonnes, except the storage space required to store the hydrogen would have to be 720 cubic metres. To make 50 tonnes of hydrogen for 50 jumbo jets would mean 2,500 tonnes of liquid hydrogen a day. 22,500 cubic metres of water, consumption of 100,000 people and the power of about 8 nuclear power plants to reduce it. Even when we get the hydrogen, it's hard to store in transport. It can embrittle steel and other metals. It has to be stored at great pressures for such a highly explosive gas. Even if it was stored in metal hydrides in a solid state form, the containers are heavy and the hydride has to be heated to release the hydrogen. Hydrogen burns clear and has no smell. If hydrogen was entered the car's cabin, the tiny electric spark moving on your body across a statically charged seat cover would be enough to ignite the gas. The measures have to be put in place to even store a fuel cell car in a confined space like a garage. So what about all that stuff you can get on the internet about running your car on water? You can get the plans off the net, usually for a price, and run your car on water, right? Isn't it a conspiracy? that all companies buy the designs out and tell the inventors to Most keep quiet or else? Most of these kinds of schemes, the so-called silver bullet schemes, uh, try to violate uh, uh, a law of physics somewhere. <laughs> and um, most of them, uh, it, and it, many of them, uh, strike a perpetual motion. <laughs> Water-powered cars just don't exist. And you can use electrolysis to create hydrogen to extend the range of the car. But to create fuel from water, it would have been done when the first internal combustion cars were built. Countries like Cuba or China would use this technology today if it existed, but it doesn't. As we saw before, fuel cells sound very promising, converting hydrogen with oxygen in the air to create power directly. But the only fuel cell that can start producing power quickly enough from a car from startup is the PEM, or Proton Exchange Membrane Fuel Cell. They don't like the cold and have to run on pure hydrogen. But the single biggest problem with the PEM fuel cell is that need platinum to make them work, a metal more expensive than gold. Many attempts are being made to try and make fuel cells cheaper, but progress is slow. Australian scientists at Monash University are using Gore-Tex, a conductive plastic, to replace the need for platinum in PEM fuel cells. While the prospect of cheap fuel cells is very exciting, with a large potential market outside the automotive industry, the technology is still far, far away. The only fuel cell car that you can currently buy, or be at least, the Honda Clarity, uses lithium-ion battery technology to store the energy from regenerative braking and help the fuel cell with the greater load variations the electric motor needs under acceleration.